Father's Day. Today, uh, I just really felt from the Lord that um, we've done it different times throughout different years of going, well, you know, maybe we, we should release the theme for the year, um, you know, the first week in January. And then we ended up doing it at the beginning of the fiscal year last year. I really felt like Father's Day was the day that the Lord wanted us to release the theme for this year at Seven Mountains. And so every all of the teachings that we're going to do is kind of going to be through the lens of by grace through faith. Today, I'm going to highlight specifically what that means. We're going to take a look at some definitions. But, um, you know, as a pastor, um, you know, I go to a lot of conferences, not as many as I'd like to. I used to be a conference junkie. Um, but I am, praise the Lord, getting to go with my family, and then I'm meeting my brother and his family and my mom and dad, and we're going out the first week in July to Colorado uh, for the Summer Family Bible Conference at Karis Bible College. So I'm so excited about that. You got it. Are you, you, you beat me to it, Chuck, because you could hear the feedback too. Um, so yeah, so I'm really looking forward to that. But again, I, I, I go to those kinds of things. I talk with other people, and, and I really believe that you know, whether it's believing for healing, whether it's like, you know, some days you're like, okay, I know I'm saved, but I don't feel saved. And I really believe that more people struggle with this than people let on is whether they're trying to believe for their healing, whether they're trusting God that they will be saved because maybe you just had a bad week and the devil got the best of you. And then it's like, well, I've got to repent because like now there's this distance between me and God and you know, if, I, if, if I've committed sin this week, then I feel like that's probably why the Lord's not answering my prayers. And, and I, I think that there are, again, more people that struggle with this than let on. But I've also talked with many people that do struggle with this. And, and for me, I think it's a knowledge problem. It's a lack of understanding that your right standing with God is irrelevant when it comes to your behavior. A couple amens. Okay, I will explain myself on that. And again, I love the Apostle Paul when he's writing in Romans, which uh, I love that Andrew Womack from Karis Bible College says that Romans is Paul's masterpiece on grace. And if you actually read Romans from chapter 1 all the way, I believe the last chapter is 15, um, and if I'm wrong, then I, you know, I'm, you're going to have to give me grace as a, as a, as a pastor. But it, it, it is a progression that builds, but Paul preaches grace to the point where he has to ask and answer his own questions in this letter to the church in Rome. He's writing to the Gentile church in Rome. And he says, you know, you're saved by grace. You know, it has nothing to do with works and all of this kind of stuff. So he asks the question, well, what then? Shall we sin because we're no longer under law but under grace? And he says, may it never be. How could you who have died to sin and come into the grace of Jesus now want to live any more in it? And I have heard a teacher say this one time, and I really believe it to be true, and I try to do the best with me. He said, pastors should be teaching grace to the point where other people would accuse that pastor of preaching grace to the point of it could be misunderstood as just saying you could go out and live in sin. Because Paul himself anticipated that people would criticize him of this. And he even says in one of his letters, as some slanderously report about us, meaning they're saying these things that aren't true, but Paul preached grace to the point where people would accuse him of saying, well, what are you saying? Should, can we go ahead and live in sin? And then he said, where, where sin abounds, grace in the Greek is the word superabounds or abounded much more. And then, again, he asks and answers his own question. He says, well, what then? Should I sin so that grace abounds? And he says, may it never be. Grace is not a license to sin. If, if, if you can have the revelation of grace in your life, it will change you so that you will not do those things. And, and, and again, it doesn't make sense logically because we think, well, there needs to be discipline. There needs to be consequences. And how many of you know without... Uh, God's wrath coming down on you, there are just natural consequences of doing sin in this world, right? You rob a bank and get caught, you're going to jail. That has nothing to do with God, okay? You know, you want, you know if you want to go out and have lots of different partners and all of that kind of stuff, there's going to be consequences in your body and in, you know, it may shorten your life. 
So there are already consequences for sin. And some people are like, well, yeah, but lying or this and this and this and this, there's not going to be consequences under the law. I've talked to people who have, you know, one time came up with kind of a great lie with one of their family members, and they don't even speak anymore, and it's been like 15 years. So sin always carries consequences, but not from God, because God the Father has already punished Jesus for every sin you will ever commit. It's not your past sins, and then now the new ones, you got to get it under the blood. I don't know where we came up with that concept. The blood covered your sin 2,000 years ago. So technically, all your sin, as far as Jesus is concerned, is future sin anyway, right? Okay, so there is no past sin. There is no current sin. There is no future sin. It's been wiped away. And again, logically, people would say then, well, if all of my sins are forgiven, then I should just be able to go and live however I want. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if that is your logical conclusion, you have not had the revelation of grace. Because guess what? We were already dead in our trespasses, but then Jesus. We were already doomed. The day we were born, we were doomed because we were of the seed of Adam. But now in Christ, the Bible actually says we are now of believing Abraham. Now we understand that God is our ultimate father, but Paul also talks about in Romans 11 that we are no longer under the law or under Moses, but because we are now children of the promise, we are under our father Abraham. And he says it has nothing about being a Jew or a Gentile. It's the promise was made to Abraham of your descendant of the seed. All of the nations are yours. And again, I don't have time to teach on that whole dynamic of, of, of being Abraham's seed in the spirit. But I just, again, want to tell you that I have, I'm sure there are people out there, but I have never heard the pastors that I teach on. I have never heard one pastor said, you feel free to go out and live like the devil. Do all the worst things that you could possibly do. Don't worry because you're going to heaven someday. I've never heard anybody preach that. I'm sure that there's somebody somewhere, maybe somebody has heard that. But this whole attacking grace, the, you know, they call it greasy grace and hyper grace and all of that kind of stuff. I can guarantee you if the Apostle Paul was here teaching on grace, he would be accused of a hyper grace preacher. Because he preached grace to the point where, again, he asked and answered in his own letters. What are you saying, Paul? Are you saying that we should sin so that grace should abound? Are you saying because we are no longer under the law, should we sin? And he says, no, may it never be. Because true transformation happens when you understand how much God loves you. Another pastor said it's like this. It's not about right behaving. It's about right believing. Amen? If your faith is in Christ, and you are growing from faith to faith, you will act more righteous accidentally than you ever tried to on purpose before. So this is what we're going to be teaching, again, specifically today, but this is going to be our theme throughout the year is by grace through faith. Okay, well, if this is how we are saved, this is how we are healed, this is how we are prospered, and the list goes on. Everybody just wants to link it to just heaven someday. And I've taught in the past that the word salvation is the word sozo, which doesn't just mean uh, freedom from sins. It means uh, uh, freedom from, or deliverance would be the, uh, the right word. It means deliverance. It means uh, healing. It means so many other things. Jesus has said to people, your faith has saved you. And it was right after he did a physical healing on somebody. He could have chose to use a more specific Greek word and said, your faith has healed you. But he uses the term, your faith has saved you or sozoed you after he did a physical healing. And then the woman who washed his feet, and she was a woman of great sin, the Bible talks about. He says, woman, go your way. Your faith has saved you. So in that case, he was what? Forgiving her sins. So what I would like to open everyone's eyes up to, and maybe again, some of you are already there, so let me just lovingly remind you that everything that you receive from God in this life and the life to come is by grace through faith. Everything. And grace, the easiest way to remember this is grace is his part, and his part is already done. Faith is our part. 
That's why it's by grace through faith. Jesus saved the whole world by grace, but it, we can only access that grace through faith. So let's define grace. So grace is the word um, charis or charis, which again, we support Charis Bible College. And so now you know that Charis Bible College means Grace Bible College. Grace is defined as grace, favor, or kindness. Its biblical understanding is God leaning or extending toward us to share benefits. He is reaching out to people to give himself to people to bless them. Isn't that awesome? I mean, you just picture the father. All he wants to do when he looks down on the earth is just extend his hand out and bring you into the kingdom. That's what he wants to do. His hand is reaching. And that's what, he, that's, that's what it is. Remember, we talked about it last week. It said that we carry the, as a ministry and as ministers the gospel of reconciliation. God has, past tense, through Jesus Christ, reconciled us to himself. And so now all he's doing is extending the hand and saying, I just want a fellowship with you. Oh, and by the way, I want to bless you while you're here on this planet. Yes, will there be suffering for my name's sake? Yes. And let me emphasize, because again, there's a lot of bad teaching out there on this. Suffering comes because of his name. If you get sick, it's not because God wants you to suffer. You get sick because we're in a fallen world. But people will say all the time, oh, this is the cross that I bear, this is my burden, this is this and this and this. Unless it does not come because of his name's sake, then it's not persecution and you can fight tooth and nail to get out of that suffering. I just want to be very clear about that because I've been in some weird groups where people just embrace their sickness as it's somehow God getting glory out of it. And it's wrong. There's nowhere in the Bible we see that. Nowhere. And anything that is labeled persecution or suffering is like when the apostles were jailed for preaching Jesus. When they were flogged in front of the temple for directly defying the Pharisees and the Sadducees and they continued to preach Jesus. All of them died except for John, martyrs' deaths, because of the name of Jesus. Amen. I just want to be that very clear because, again, I, I want to cut through the noise of the teaching out there that sickness and depression and cancer and all of these other things is somehow from the Lord so that you can experience suffering and know what that's like. How many of you know that Jesus did not get sick? Amen. And how many of you know that Jesus went from town to town targeting sickness and destroying it? He went around from town to town and found people that were not whole, that maybe they could not walk, they could not hear, they could not see, and he opened their eyes and he opened their ears and he said, rise up, pick up your mat and walk. If those are the examples that we have to Jesus, and the Bible says that we are supposed to be Jesus in the earth as he is, so are we in this world. We know that discipleship, that Jesus literally created other people to take his place when he left, the 12, the 70, the 120 in the upper room, and then he told them to do the same. We are supposed to be replicating Christ in the earth. Paul says, imitate me, as I imitate Christ. There was never supposed to be any kind of diluting of that process. I hear people all the time say this, and, and I know they're, they're saying it um, just with a lack of, of, of understanding. You know, we'll, we'll look at some of the greats um, from just 100 years ago, people like Smith Wigglesworth, John G. Lake, Catherine Kuhlman, and people will say, I want Catherine Kuhlman's anointing. Or they'll say, I want John G. Lake's healing anointing. And I just want to just say, with all the love in the world, you have the anointing of Christ on you. Amen? And this is not a new problem. They were dealing with this back then, and Paul had to address it. Hey, I've heard that some of you are saying, well, you know what? I got baptized by Peter. 
Peter, I got baptized by Paul, and he's got the deep revelation. And other people are like, well, I got baptized by Apollos. We come into that today. Well, I follow so-and-so's ministry. Eh, so-and-so's ministry's got it okay, but here's where all the super deep stuff is. And believe me, in the, in it, I have been caught, get guilty of being caught up in that too. And yes, we're partial to certain teachers here because we want you to be able to get teaching that is in the zone or in the sphere of what we teach here. That doesn't mean that other teachers are, are, are wrong or that they're you know, going to hell or they're false teachers or anything like that. We want to teach a certain, in a certain sphere, in a certain vision, in a certain focus. And so when you see the list of teachers that we put up in the scrolling announcements, those are just teachers that would, it would be similar teaching to us. But we can't get caught up in worshiping teachers. Again, I I don't want Elijah's anointing. I have Jesus's anointing. Everything has to come back to Jesus. Jesus should have the preeminence in our life. And I was talking to somebody the other day. I, I, get, I get concerned with the body of Christ as a whole because I think some of the stuff that's really out there on the fringes is happening because somewhere in, the, in our subconscious without knowing it, we think that Jesus isn't enough. Or that he's just enough for heaven, but he's not enough for healing. Or he might be enough for healing, but he's not enough for provision. Well, he may be enough for provision, but he's not good enough to heal my depression. He may be good enough to heal my depression, but he's not good. And so we have to do all of these things. Oh, yeah, 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 I know Jesus can do all this, but have you read this book? Oh, yeah, I've read that book, but have you read this book? And I'm not against reading books, and I'm not against watching other teachers. I'm just saying, do not stray away from Jesus, because if you're looking to get healed, he is the healer. If you are looking for the way to the Father to experience God, he is the way. He is the truth. Well, you know, there's just a lot of weird stuff out there. How do we know what the truth is from a lie anymore? Jesus. Anything he said is truth. Anything that he said was a lie is a lie. So grace is him extending his hand towards us. Okay, well, if that's grace, then what is faith? Faith is the Greek word pistis. And it's defined as faith, belief, trust, and confidence. So again, if grace is God extending his hand towards us, extending his benefits towards us, extending his favor towards us, then our response is to have faith in that reaching to have belief in it, to trust it, and to have confidence in it. And it's not just a one-time thing. People are like, oh, yeah, I believed and got baptized. No, 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 no. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of your life. Because you may say that you believed on that day that you'll get to go to heaven someday, but what are you going to do when you're believing for a job? What are you going to do when you're believing for your future spouse? What are you going to do when you're believing for, and just insert those things there? And it's already been bought and paid for. Again, I quote this scripture all the time, but I love it. Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up to us, how will he not also through him freely give us all things? But we have to trust and believe that. I always uh, remember the example. It's like if they're, you know, you, you hear about the marriage supper of the lamb. I see this table that is so wide and so long that I can't see where it ends, full of lots of food. And it won't go to our thighs in heaven, praise Jesus. And, and I feel that the same table is offered to us here on earth, but many of us, because of either a lack of understanding or a lack of faith, are like, I, I'll take this salvation for heaven someday. I'll, I'll take this um, so that my kids, you know, are safe. I'll pray for them, and then I'll take this. But he's saying, no, 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 no. You can have it all. If he paid for it all, why wouldn't we take it all? Again, I've prayed with people before that are people, are, they'll say, I'm like, well, what can I pray for you for? And they'll say, well, and they usually have a list which is fine because uh, we serve a very big God. But they'll say, uh, you know, I have back pain, I have foot pain, I have right elbow pain, and I have cancer. 
And then they'll say, but if God would just take away my cancer, I could live with the pain. And then I'm just like, oh, okay, well, that's your choice to live with the pain. But I'm pretty sure if God spoke the universe into existence, he can deal with your elbow pain. We think if God heals someone with stage four cancer, the lights start to, you know, start to dim in heaven because, you know, it just takes way too much power to heal stage four. But if that's what we think, then let's just be honest that that's where our faith is at. I kind of alluded to this, I think it was last week, maybe it was the week before, but we need to stop judging people and just realize people are at different places in their faith. Amen? There's churches all over this place that don't have faith for healing. And that stinks, but we don't judge them for that. They need to have the revelation of that. We could, we could tell them and maybe point it out in Scripture, but don't lose sleep over it. There's whole ministries out there that attack other churches because other churches believe in healing and they believe that God wants to bless us and all of that kind of stuff. And we're actually going to see some of those scriptures today. And, you know, I, I used to say all the time that I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, we are a church of 80. Believe me, I want to grow. But I mean, if I had some big TV ministry and that kind of stuff, the amount I've talked to some of these pastors um, like Andrew Womack and I've talked with Bill Johnson at Bethel. I mean, they get hate mail all the time. And it's from Christians. Instead of just going, listen, if you don't want to believe in these things, then fine, why are you attacking a church that does? Don't go to church there. Don't watch their stuff. Doesn't this seem really simple? I know it bothers us, and I get it. It, I, it. it bothers me when I see Christians that think they've cornered the market on theology and attacking spirit-filled, charismatic-type churches. And that actually happens more in that camp than the other. And I'm not telling you to pick a camp. I'm just saying, why can't we just say, hey, here's where my faith is at. If I want to believe for healing, leave me alone. Who are you? If you don't want to believe for healing, I'm not going over there and slapping you around going, you, you should believe for healing. If you don't want to believe for healing, fine. Why can't we just be where we're at and what we understand? Because how many of us know that where we were in our faith three years ago is not where we are today? There was a time that I grew up in a church that I call it a father, son, and holy Bible church. All the only time I heard about the Holy Spirit was when they dunked you under the water. But other than that, he wasn't really talked about that much. So I used to be there. I've told the story in here before that when my wife got baptized in the Holy Spirit, she, she kind of wanted that. But two weeks before that, we were watching Rodney Howard Brown, and he was touching people, and people were falling out laughing, and she scoffed at that. And that's why the reason that there aren't more Christians. And then two weeks later, I prayed over her, started speaking in tongues, and then she giggles. And then she stopped herself, and I said, why did you do that? Well, I didn't want you to think I was being disrespectful. And I said, God gave you that manifestation because you just made fun of it two weeks ago. Not because God was getting her back, but he loves her so much and just wanted to give her to the revelation and going, if people are so full of joy that they can't stop laughing just thinking about me, why is that a bad thing? And again, some people are like, well, yeah, but that's fake. And da, 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 da. I'm sure some of it is, but who are we to judge? If you don't want to go to Rodney Howard Brown's church and fall out and laugh and that kind of stuff, then don't go. This is where I want us to get and where it, with our faith is just going, where is your faith? I used to read the scriptures and because I'd have all of these debates with different people and they'd be like, well, oh, you're one of those faith guys. So you're saying when someone doesn't get healed, you're going to tell them it's something to do with their faith. And I said, well, if I get a word from the Lord, yes, I will. And I'll say it in love. But we cannot deny the fact that different situations, there were different things going on, but the overall issue was faith. Did you know that the Bible says that Jesus, when he was in his hometown, it says, could do no mighty works because of their unbelief. The power of Christ, who is God in the flesh, was stopped because of human beings' unbelief. 
So I started reading this again, and I can see how people could read this and go, yeah, this can be very judgy. And, I, and of course, I have heard stories, bad stories, about people who, like, lost a child, and they're like, oh, well, you know, it's probably because you didn't have enough faith. I mean, that is a terrible thing to say. But I started reading this in a whole new lens, and when Jesus says, it's been done according to your faith, he's not using that as a way to condemn them if it doesn't happen and lift them up if it does. He's just saying, this is how it works. Does that make sense? Because again, people are like, oh, but if you just say it has to do with their faith. No, I know I'm believing. And I've heard that line. I know I have perfect faith. I don't know. I'm like, well, then what's the problem? Is it God? Does he just not like you? Because I'm pretty sure that he gave his son to die on the cross. So I don't get into debates with people anymore. But I'm just saying, if Jesus himself said in multiple scenarios, it's been done according to your faith. How many of you know whether you go to heaven or not is done according to your faith? Right? Because people who don't believe, they're not going there. So if salvation is done according to faith, could it be that God has set it up that way for everything else? I mean, why would he just say, well, you know, it's done according to your faith to get to heaven, but for healing, it's done this way, and for prosperity, it's done this way, and for protection over your children, it's done this way, and we have to memorize all of these different formulas in in order to receive from God. It's just faith. We are saved by grace through faith. Faith is how it works. What do we try to tell people when we lead them to the Lord? Oh, you know, God has forgiven your sins, so repent, change your mind to the idea that you have been forgiven, and now make him the Lord of your life. That's faith. I am trusting solely on the fact that nothing about myself is good, everything about him is good, and therefore I'm only going to heaven because he is good. Okay, so we just covered only the first sentence there. This word comes from peitho, which means to be persuaded or to come to faith. This is interesting. In secular Greek culture, it meant a guarantee or a warranty. Hebrews 11 defines faith as the substance or assurance of things expected, the proof of the unseen. Now, most of your Bibles translate it as uh, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, again, if you've been attending here for some time, in the Greek, the word hope is always translated expectation. And I always... I always beat that drum because in our world culture today, hope just means like, well, I see it's supposed to rain in the forecast, but I hope it doesn't. No, hope is an expectation. If we say that our hope is in Jesus, what that means is we expect to be with him someday. Right? You expect it. You don't just like, I don't know, it's like a coin toss if I'm going to get in or not. You absolutely, based on your faith in Christ, expect to inherit heaven. So when you say you hope for that, you're expecting it to happen. So that's why Hebrews 11 defines faith as the substance or assurance of things expected, the proof of the unseen. Why? When someone gets healed, yes, you can measure that result later, but we didn't see how it took place. We know the Holy Spirit did it. We know we prayed in the name of Jesus. And again, we may be able to show x-rays before and x-rays after, or you actually feel the symptoms in your body go away and things like that. But, but faith activating grace to heal that person, we didn't see that happen. We prayed believing in faith. We laid hands on believing in faith. We anointed with oil believing in faith. Not faith in our faith, but faith in the fact of Jesus provided it 2,000 years ago at the cross. Faith is the bridge to bring heaven to earth. Okay, next. Okay, so here's a good way to say this. Grace is what God has already done through Jesus in extending himself toward us in blessing. Faith is our response, persuasion, and complete trust in this grace 
that we cannot perceive with our five senses, yet know it exists and is our dominant reality. There are times where, you know, people will talk about, oh, I got, I got tingles, I got goosebumps, the, the hair on my arm is raising up. Now, that could be the manifestation of something going on from God. We don't, all, we don't use that as our barometer, though. Because how many of you know you could see something horrific and violent and the hairs on your arm might stand up too? But like if you were in the presence of the Lord and you're worshiping or something and you get a tingle or a goosebump or something, you know, praise the Lord. But again, let's just always have faith in that grace. Because again, I've been in certain circles where people are like, man, I just, I just felt the tangible presence of the Lord. The Lord is here. Did you feel it? Did you feel it? And other people are like, yeah. And then there was a time where somebody looked at me, do you feel the Holy Ghost? And I'm like, no. But that doesn't mean he's not here. Because we can be careful, not careful. We can move into a carnal mode. Because again, I've also been around people that have walked into a church and they decided within the first three minutes before one song was sung, before a message was given, before we took communion or anything, I just don't feel the presence of the Lord here. This is a dead church. That's terrible. Who are you to say anything? If there's people coming together, worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth, that church is alive. I know that I, there, there's a, just a temptation to do it, or if you walked into a church and saw like seven people, be like, how could anybody go here? It's like a funeral service and all that kind of stuff. Okay, but let's not judge people's hearts. I see people who sing the most drab hymns in all the world, and I will see tears coming down their eyes. For me to say that that's a drab hymn, I just made a judgment about something. I may not personally like that song. They might not be my personal style. But I see tears as they're singing, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So we got to be careful as a generation that maybe didn't grow up singing hymns not to judge that. But then I've been on the other side of that equation we're like when we're in here watching videos on planet shakers and people are doing backflips and playing the guitar and we're like, man, this is awesome. Jesus is awesome. And people are like, that's so carnal. When are you going to get the fog machine? <laughs> there are literally pastors out there. Oh, you know, we need to return back to the Lord instead of being about fog machines and skinny jeans. What does it matter what we dress like? Again, anybody seen Jesus Revolution? They weren't wearing shoes in church. And they were worried about the shag carpeting. That's why Paul brings it to spirit and truth. That's it. When we get into all of these other things, oh, well, we're not going to see the glory cloud come down if we don't sing for at least two hours. Where is that in Scripture? I once saw this thing on Facebook, and, and normally I'm just like, eh, I don't know if that's real or not, but I actually have talked to this guy um, on Facebook, on Messenger before, so, I mean, I'm not, like, close. We're not, like, close friends. And they were simply getting ready for a service that hadn't even started yet, and this mist appeared on the ceiling. And it was not a fog machine because it wasn't anywhere else. It was just circling the ceiling. And so they didn't sing 200 worship songs before that. They didn't have the most anointed speaker to, you know what? Maybe God was just like, hey, I live outside of time. I'm already excited about what's going to happen tonight. I think I'm just going to hover up here on the ceiling. That was awesome. But we put these things and we have these expectations in our mind that God is going to somehow move and work the way that we think he is because we think carnally many times. How many of you know there's no glory cloud in here, but the spirit of the Lord is in this place? He will never leave us nor forsake us. Now, sometimes there's a physical manifestation of those things. Sometimes people, I've heard, you know, I've seen it happen where people are walking and then they just fall over and hit the ground. They're like, I don't know. There was just like this, felt like this pressure. It, it, was, it felt like it was on top, but not really. It was from the inside and I just fell down. And you know, when people, some people are like, I don't know if that was real or not. Well, you know what? There's some people I know without a doubt that they fake that stuff, but there's some that it's real, if we would just stop judging it and just go, if they fell out under the power of the Lord, praise the Lord. All right, next verse. 
This is Paul, again, writing in the first chapter of Romans. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is, and there's a definite article here of the, it's not a power, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that what? Believes. It does not say it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone. To everyone who believes. It is the power. The word power is dunamis in the Greek, which means miraculous power, might, and strength. And sometimes when we think about miraculous, we think about, you know, the lame walking, deaf ears open, and that kind of stuff. And it is miraculous. But this says that it is the power of God unto salvation. How many of you know that it is going to be a greater supernatural miracle than even raising someone from the dead, that in the moment that we see him, that our bodies will actually be transformed into a glorified state. That is pretty miraculous. The fact that we will go from being a mortal being to an eternal being. Those are miraculous things. So when it talks about that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God unto salvation. Yes, heaven. Yes, our new bodies. Yes, we're going to be worshiping all the time. That is all encompassed under dunamis, Miraculous power, might, and strength, but it's also encompassed in healing and miracles here and provision here. He says, first to the Jew, then to the Greek, for in it, what is it? The gospel of Christ, the power of God. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed or unveiled from what? Faith to faith. How is it unveiled? Faith to faith. Is faith God's part or our part? Ours. So that's again why I think that it is a good thing for us not to judge other people because if the power of God, the gospel of Christ unto salvation is in, in that contains the righteousness of God that is revealed from faith to faith. Now, again, I could sit here and tell you what I told you last week, that it's not about our righteousness, right? Our righteousness is of, of filthy rags, not our sin, our righteousness. And so it's not our righteousness, it's his righteousness. But it says that, that the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The righteousness of God is not a concept you go, okay, not my righteousness, God's righteousness. The depth of that would take you a hundred lifetimes to understand. And I believe that as you move from faith to faith into the understanding that none of you are righteous, I am not righteous, he is righteous because he lives in me and I in him, I believe how you know that you are growing in your faith walk dependent on how you treat other people with this knowledge. I believe that the treatment of people on planet Earth is a litmus test of how much you're really growing in your walk. I do it for myself. I'm not living this perfectly, but I'm, I'm always asking myself, am I, am I loving this person the best possible way that I, I can? Am I loving my enemies? Because that's the litmus test. Because if it's his righteousness, then I'm not righteous. My righteousness doesn't stand on its own. So therefore, people that are signing legislation to murder babies, to mutilate children, to swap out body parts, in all of this insanity, if they had faith that they're not righteous and the righteousness of God is the only thing that sustains them, I guarantee you, you wouldn't, they wouldn't be doing this. And so our job is to not condemn them. Our job is to bring them to the truth in love. I'm not saying, that, I'm not saying to not be aware of what's going on in culture and to you know, instruct your children of beware of these situations. I'm not saying we don't call out sin. Okay, but we don't do it in a way to judge other people. The judgment is coming. Amen? But the Bible also says that the measure by which we judge other people, we will be judged. And that does not mean going, well, you know what? I'm against these people that are grooming children. I'm not grooming children, so I won't be judged of that. No, it's saying by the me measure with which you dispense judgment. 
So if you're like the sin police, do you want God to be the sin police on your sin? I would rather just receive the grace of God and have him not judge me and believe that he judged his son 2,000 years ago. Again, we must be aware of what's going on and protect our children. Please don't misunderstand. And we don't stop saying that something is sin in order to be inclusive. But you better believe. You know, somebody who may have killed someone and they're out of prison, they're welcome here. If someone may have hurt a child at one point, and they've repented at that, they're welcome here. A transgender person is welcome here. Because guess what? Liars are welcome here. And fornicators are welcome here. And people that hate other people are welcome here. Doesn't mean what they're doing is right, but they're welcome here. Because I don't live right 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I'm so thankful that God welcomes me. All right, next verse. If the righteousness of God is ours by faith alone, then what is this grace that our faith rests on? Now, I'm going to read through this quickly. So if you have your notes, um, this is listed in here, or you can go to it in your Bible, Ephesians 1, 3 through, 9, 3 through 19. If the righteous, but here's the question. If the righteousness of God is ours by faith alone, then what is this grace that our faith rests on? Because again, we can go, well, yeah, I have faith in grace, or I have faith in God's love for me, but the world has been redefining love Grace is undeserved, unmerited favor. But I want to know when it says, when, when I make the statement that grace is his part, faith is my part, I want to know what I can have faith in. Because you cannot have faith in something that has not been given by grace. Does this make sense? Like there's some people that are like, well, I'm really believing for this and I'm believing for this. Okay, but did God give that by grace? Because if he didn't, it ain't going to happen. Because you're not trying to make something come into existence by your faith. All you're doing is appropriating the thing that's already in existence that you can't perceive with your five senses. Does this make sense? You're not putting faith into to materialize something. You're putting faith in something that by the Spirit has already been provided. And what is this grace? So let's, I'm just going to read through this. It says, blessed be the God... And Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, this is all past tense, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Again, I, I, I've taught on this before. Do you understand he chose you in Christ before time and space existed? Now, people are like, yeah, but that feels like Calvinism and predestination. Listen, it is predestination, but it also says in another part of the Bible, those whom he foreknew, he predestined. So he says that he chose you. It doesn't say he chose you. It says he chose you in Christ. So therefore, he can't choose you outside of Christ. So if you are not in Christ, he doesn't choose you. Does that make sense? That's how two things can be right at the same time. Two things can be correct. Two different things can be correct at the same time. He can choose you, but he chooses you in Christ. And so he knew that you were going to receive Jesus, so he chose you before the foundation of the world because he knew you were going to be in Christ and believe. Does this make sense? If some of you are like, no, it doesn't, it's okay. We're linear beings. We don't always understand the concept of being outside of time. But he did choose you. And I think that that's awesome to know that he chose me before he said, let there be light. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. 
He also predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself. There it is again. He predestined. What does that mean? It means he sets up your destiny ahead of time. And again, sometimes that throws people off. Because they're like, well, that, again, that just feels like he picks and chooses some, but not others. But it says he predestines us for adoption through Jesus Christ. He cannot adopt you if you are not in Christ. You cannot be in Christ unless you believe that you are in Christ. And then, therefore, if you believe that you are in Christ, then now you know you are an adopted son and daughter of the Most High. So he uh, predestined us as adoption through Jesus Christ to himself. According to what? Because we, we were acting really good and deserved it? No. It says, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, with which he favored us. And there it is again, in the beloved. Who is the beloved? Jesus. So again, the grace, the good pleasure of his will, the praise of his glory, he favored on us in the beloved. In him, meaning in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our wrongdoings, according to what? According to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. So again, why does, why does God do all this? Because we're really good people? No, it was the good pleasure of his will. Why did he do it? Because he's kind. Why did he do it? Because it's done according to the riches of his grace. So again, I, I emphasize this because we cannot be grace dispensers if we don't understand that d grace has been dispensed on us. If we think for some reason we deserve God's attention, his love, his affection, and that kind of stuff, if, you're, if some of us are like, well, I don't really believe that it's that way, but if you dispense grace on people that you think deserve it, you don't understand grace. Again, there's your litmus test. If you only, if you only bestow favor and mercy and kindness and compassion on people that you think are deserving of it, you do not understand grace. The Bible talks about grace and works are on the opposite sides of things. It says if grace is now of works, then grace is no longer grace. And then it goes on to say, but if it's by works and not by grace then works are no longer works, meaning that it has to be one or the other. You either receive from God based on your works or you receive from God based on grace. And so therefore, if you like to receive the abundance of grace, then God is teaching this to us so that we will dispense an abundance of grace on other people, whether they deserve it or not. I'm just letting that hang out there because I'm not, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not even there yet. I cannot tell you that I just walk around and when I see certain people that I know that are living destructive lifestyles, my, my, it's not always my first default thing is my heart going out to them. Sometimes, if I can just be real for you, I'm like, they're a product of their own decisions. And even though that's truth, that's not compassion and mercy and love and an abundance of grace. So I'm not up here pointing the finger. I'm asking you to take this journey with me. So it's according to the riches of grace. We have forgiveness of our wrongdoings according to what? The riches of his grace. It says, in all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he set forth in him. So how do we know the mysteries of God? It's all in Christ. What's the mystery of God? We were these terrible people that didn't deserve anything, and then he just loves us into wholeness and completeness. The Bible says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. It says, regarding his plan of the fullness of the times to bring all things together in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. See, Christ is over the heavens and the earth. In him we also have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, again meaning Jesus, who works all things in accordance with the plan of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in the Christ would be to the praise of his glory. 
In him, Jesus, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is a first installment of our inheritance. You understand that we have the Holy Spirit and we have the ability to raise people from the dead, and this is called a first installment? I can't wait. who is the first installment of our inheritance in regards to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. This is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, look at this, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So see, it's not about us trying to get from God. It's about us knowing him to the point that we can just trust him, that we are adopted, that we are chosen, that we are predestinated, that we are going to inherit heaven someday, that we already sit with Jesus Christ in heavenly places. That's why it's faith. There's there's not, God God is not sitting in heaven going, I really just want to do a great move, but I, I don't know, I just haven't picked a date yet. He has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness by the Spirit on the inside of us. The problem is we're just not accessing it because we don't have faith if we're really honest with ourselves. If we all had the faith that Jesus talked about, we would be raising people from the dead. We would be instantly healing people. We would be doing all of these things that the early church apostles did because they got it. And even they didn't walk in it perfectly, but they got some great results if you read the book of Acts. So he doesn't say, pray that God will send revival, pray that there will be a great move of God. He says, I pray for you that you may receive a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. Look what else he prays. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. I pray that the eyes of your heart may having been enlightened so that you will know what is the expectation of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the boundless greatness of his power toward us who what? Believe. And this is one section of scripture, but the main point that I want you to get, and that's why it's going to encompass everything that we're going to teach on, is you have to understand that in order for you to receive from God in your life, you have to believe. And if there is a barrier on that, then you need to pray, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of the heart of my understanding that I may have wisdom and revelation of what you've already past tense given me. But we don't, that's not our default setting. Our default setting is if we don't get something, it's, you know, oh God, what do I need to do to get this? What do I need to do? What hoop do I need to jump from and he, jump through? And what he's saying is have a revelation of who he is and what he's already given you in the spirit. That's why I love the teaching on spirit, soul, and body. If you understand that, everything has already been given to us in the spirit. Did you see what it said? It says that we were sealed, vacuum-packed when we were given the Holy Spirit. Don't worry about your salvation from day to day. If you lost your salvation, you'll know it because you no longer believe in Jesus Christ. That's it. You're not going to sin your way out of this. Because if you could sin your way out of it, then you could produce enough works to make yourself righteous. And both of those concepts are wrong. You don't sin. I'm trying to figure out a good way to say this. The reason that you sin is not because you are a sinner. The reason you sin is because you are, have been fallen from Adam, but your spirit has been reborn. So the whole purpose of this life is your spirit training your soul, teaching your body how to act. Does that make sense? I don't know that I can. You're not, you do not sin because you're a sinner. Okay, you're no longer a sinner. You're saved by grace. Your spirit has been regenerated. So this life is about getting your spirit to teach your soul, to teach your body how to act. Thank you. I didn't know if I was going to come out again. 
But it's what it is. And if you understand that, then you don't get mad at yourself and you're just like, oh, I'm just an angry person. No, you just need to wake up to who you are on the inside. You just, it's, it's, it's like bad habits, bad behavior. Just stop it and realize who you are in the spirit. And it's a process. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How, do, how does the outside of you transform from faith to faith? What is faith to faith? Well, we just read it up here. It's by having a revelation of the righteousness of God, which is your righteousness. It says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Well, that sounds like we're saying that we're like God. No, God's saying, I'm giving you my God righteousness. And now that's the way I see you. Some people have said it like this. When he looks at us, he doesn't see us. He sees his son. And we just think like, this is just too good to be true. And that by definition is the gospel. The, true, the too good to be true news. It is too good to be true. But don't try to dig into it why it's too good to be true. Just believe it and receive it. Because if, this, this is the whole problem with us people. We want to we wanna overthink it. We want to go, but is this really, is this, I'm going to have to come up with the knowledge to understand this. That's the, that's the wrong tree. It's the wrong tree. That was Adam and Eve's problem. They ate from the wrong tree. We need to eat from the tree of life. And Jesus said, I have come to give you life and that you will hand of it more abundantly. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Eat from him. He is the tree of life. Which, you know, like right now, it's all flooding into my mind, which is probably why he said you must eat my flesh and drink my blood because from the origins of the earth, he was the tree we were supposed to eat from. And so, we're, again, we're going to be talking more about this, but what I want you to take away is just to realize everything has been appropriate. Everything has been given by grace. We have to appropriate it by faith. Stop asking God to do something for you that he's already done. Just believe it and trust him. Pray and fast to twist God's arm. No, to get out of your carnal self so that you can laser beam focus on what he wants to give you, which is what he's already given you by grace. I believe that this is going to set some people free in their prayer life. I believe that this is going to set some people free with physical issues that you might be dealing with, with, with soulish issues that you may be dealing with. It's already been dispensed. And now we just have to put faith behind it. And remember, it says from faith to faith. There's no way that everybody's faith in this room is the same with everybody else. We're all in different walks. So instead of criticizing or looking down on some people or the people that are down, looking at other people and going, well, you just think you're better than me because you've been walking with the Lord longer. Let's just stop all of that nonsense and just going, where you, we are responsible for where our faith is at. When I stand before God, it's just going to be God, me, and then I'm going to have my arms wrapped really tightly around Jesus because he's the only one getting me in. But no one's going to stand there and go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Pastor Josh, he, he did a lot of really good things. And then there's all these other people going, yeah, but, you know, I saw him do this and I saw him do this. None of that's going to be there. So if there's not going to be any judgment from other people in heaven, why are we doing it here? God is the one who will judge us. And I don't want to be judged by the measure that I judge other people so it's just easier not to. Amen.